Every week on CyberWork, listeners ask us the same question. What cybersecurity skills should I learn? Well, try this. Go to infosecinstitute.com slash free to get your free cybersecurity talent development ebook. It's got in-depth training plans for the 12 most common roles, including SOC analyst, penetration tester, cloud security engineer, information risk analyst, privacy manager, secure coder, and more. We took notes from employees and a team of subject matter experts to build training plans that align with the most in-demand skills. You can use the plans as is or customize them to create a unique training plan that aligns with your own unique career goals. One more time, just go to infosecinstitute.com slash free or click the link in the description to get your free training plans, plus many more free resources for cyber work listeners. Do it. Infosecinstitute.com slash free. Now, on with the show. Today on cyber work, Dr. Chanel Suggs, Duchess of Cybersecurity, is my very special guest. Dr. Suggs is a teacher, business owner, thought leader, and has appeared on TV and podcast platforms around the world to talk about cybersecurity and hacker mentality. She has also had an incredibly challenging and sometimes seemingly insurmountable upbringing. Her tumultuous story can be found in her book, Against All Odds, Overcoming Racial, Sexual, and Gender Harassment on the Digital Battlefield. This episode contains a lot of heartbreak and some challenging stories, as well as some incredible insights and some thoroughly important takeaways, as well as uh, an awful lot of triumphs. I hope you'll join me today on CyberWork. Welcome to this week's episode of the CyberWork with InfoSec podcast. Each week, we talk with a different industry thought leader about cybersecurity trends, the way those trends affect the work of InfoSec professionals, while offering tips for breaking in or moving up the ladder in the cybersecurity industry. Dr. Chanel Suggs, the Duchess of Cybersecurity, is the founder and CEO of Wyvern Security. Did I pronounce that right, Wyvern? Wyvern. Wyvern, Wyvern sorry. Wyvern <laughs> Security. Uh, she is a subject matter expert in cybersecurity, forensics, network security, cryptography, and IT strategy. Uh, she is noted as the one to watch for her works within the cybersecurity community. Uh, she is a distinguished professor and speaker on hacker mentality and methodology. Dr. Soges is featured in Women Know Cyber, 100 Fascinating Females Fighting Cybercrime Exposed, Cybersecurity Handbook, Washington Post, CNN, ABC, CBS, Fox, NBC, EC Council, Miami Herald, Yahoo, various radio shows, podcasts, conferences, and many more. Uh, she is also the author of Against All Odds, Overcoming Racial, Sexual, and Gender Harassment on the Digital Battlefield. Uh, so we're going to talk to Dr. Suggs today about her book and about her personal journey. Uh, and we're going to specifically get tips for people who might want to join the cybersecurity space, but who have been previously uh, held outside the gates. Uh, and I think uh, Dr. Suggs' personal journey will uh, provide us with some, some very good insights in that regard. Dr. Suggs, thanks for joining me today. Welcome to CyberWork. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, so my usual first question to guests is, how did you get uh, first interested in computers and tech and how did that lead to your interest in cybersecurity? But based on the long line to your book, Against All Odds, Overcoming Racial, Sexual, and Gender Harassment on the Digital Battlefield, uh, the question has a heightened significance in your case. Uh, it reads, quote, uh, despite sexual assault by, from both family members and friends, physical attacks that left her disabled and a lifelong lack of support from her extended family, Dr. Chanel Suggs persevered to become a cybersecurity expert, professor, and author. So first of all, how did you overcome the emotional and psychological pain inflicted from being raped by family members growing up, especially since, as you noted, your mother actively contributed to the abuse and wasn't there to support you? Well, I will say it was very difficult to overcome as I was very young when it began. But for me, in order to heal, I had to understand that the things that happened to me weren't my fault. Mm -hmm. And I think that a lot of people that go through these things in life, they actually feel like it was their fault when actually it was not. Yeah. So as a child, I've always wondered, what did I do to deserve to be treated so terribly? But as I grew to be an adult, I realized that I didn't deserve to be treated that way. Um, I was by my family. It was my family when I look at them as far as the constant ridicule that was put against me as a child as I was growing up. So I had to learn to defend for myself since the age of 10. But in all actuality, I actually began my first actual assault was when I was actually three or four years old. Wow. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, 
I want to move from that to, um, you know, I, I guess in this in this in this way, I want to sort of ask, what is it about the study of cybersecurity and tech that made it feel like a way out of what must, as you said, have felt like kind of a hopeless situation? Well, I love numbers. OK, <laughs> I was that at first. I love binary. Mm-hmm. So on September 30th, 1997, I was attacked by my ex, my ex. The attack left me disabled. All of my mm. media nerves were severed in my right hand, which is my dominant hand. Yeah. So after months of ser- um, after months of therapy, I felt like I wasn't getting anywhere, which mm. you could understand. Yeah. I had already been told by two top surgeons that I would never be able to work in the field work again. Period. Wow. So I needed to file for disability, as what they told me was my best course of action next. So I didn't know how I was going to survive. My family turned their back on me and didn't care about the amount of pain I was enduring on a daily basis. So I had to learn to write as well as feed and bathe myself all over again. So I was basically like an indolent. So imagine not knowing how you are going to do any of these things each day, the things that we learn as kids. So imagine going through all of this alone, feeling that your life is going to be over. Uh, So no one was going to hire me once they knew about my disability. I accepted that. And I, I will. I accepted that then because of what I was told. So I overcame all these obstacles, even though many days I wanted to give up. So after having my daughter, I realized that I couldn't just sit back and live the life that everyone else portrayed or said that was going to be my life going forward. Mm -hmm. So I went to college. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yes, I knew it was going to be difficult because I was still learning to write again. My hand was in its infancy. I had planned to go for nursing to put myself through medical school. But as time went on, I learned I would never be a surgeon because of my right hand, because my right hand is my dominant hand. So this brings us to 9-11. While in Mm. nursing school, um, I was at serious tennis nursing school at a community college. I was also attending a four-year university as well. So I got into both of them at the same month. So I decided I would try to do two universities at once. I'm always doing things like that. I'm an overachiever. Mm-hmm. I will say that. Yeah. <laughs> so at the four-year university, it was required that I took a computer science course as an elective, which is one of oh. the best things that could have ever happen to me. Yeah. So I took that first course. I fell in love with the program. I loved everything about it. Mm-hmm. So after that semester, I decided to switch. I love binary, hex, as well as assembly code. During the summer breaks, I would spend the majority of my time actually working in the lab to do a semi code for the programs that would be needed for the following week. So mm-hmm. it got to the point that it actually gave me my own key to the lab because I was there that much. Wow. I love that. <laughs> so within the first year, I realized that that was a program for me. I was able to build massive programs, which later enabled me to receive an internship. And within that internship, I ended up working on GPS systems um, for law enforcement as well as inventory services. And the funny thing was when I look back at when I look back at my actual yearbook when I was a high school student for my future career, I actually listed that I was going to be a computer engineer. Wow. OK. That, so, that really yeah. shocked me. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say that's uh, that, yeah, you, you had a you had a, a view into the future there. So um, so uh, to that end, I mean, uh, my next question was going to be, where did you begin your cybersecurity study? But obviously it was it was in this uh, this college and in this computer science area. But. Um, can you tell me about your your sort of what your first steps were when you decided you wanted to learn everything? Like what you said, you started learning like binary and you started learning like code. And then like what was the sort of like the sort of chain of of interest where you said you were you were working in the computer lab all the time? Did you work with other other people? Did you have a particularly inspiring teacher or were you like like fiercely self-directed? I was fiercely self-directed. I will say when we go back and we look at what I initially said about 9-11, what really caught my interest about it was mm-hmm. the fact that there was a lot of chatter that they were saying that was online, which noted those images that was going to be crashing into the twin, wire, the right. twin towers. Mm-hmm. It was seen by many and nobody believed it. Nobody even thought that that could occur. occurred. So on that day, I knew I wanted to be with agencies fighting terrorism to protect the U.S., so mm-hmm. as I began my studies in computer science, I learned over 15 programming languages, which was, was a lot of fun. Lisp wow. was one of those. A lot of people don't even use that program anymore. Um, yeah. I learned to gain a better understanding of code as well as how it works in each area, um, trying to play connected dots to understand the logic behind the scenes. Right. Um, this is the reason why I work to obtain so many degrees. So I work to understand each area because it actually helps me to assess situations and provide a better response to my clients. Yeah. So every degree I obtain looks at different things in different ways, which increase my knowledge in the field. So I currently have, as you know, my doctorate in cybersecurity. 
yes. in which my dis- dissertation was a focus on a fuzzy logic approach to recovering critical data from malware within host systems. Mm-hmm. I also earned a master's in networking communications and information assurance as well, project management, and I also have my MBA. Right now, I'm completing my fifth master's in data analytics. Wow. And my undergrad, as you all know, is in computer science. Yep. So I feel like the world is always changing in cyber, which is the reason why we have to stay up to date. Yes. So I can't just let my skills stop. I can't stop the learning because yeah. that's not the field that I signed up for. Yeah, yeah, no, ab- absolutely. That's a that, that's a recurring uh, chorus from 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 guests of the show is that uh, the the thing you really need if you want to get into cybersecurity is just a willingness to keep learning and keep learning and uh, changing and adapting. Like the thing you learned six months ago is already going to be changing to absolutely. something different by the end of the year. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So um, going back to the beginning of your sort of studies, were there any early victories, whether it was uh, passing a first certification exam or spo- solving a specific uh, sort of difficult problem or running a program that was challenging for a long time or maybe getting a word of encouragement from a mentor or teacher, something that made you realize, like, I'm really good at this? One of my first earliest victories was obtaining three certifications within three weeks. Wow. So at that time, I was working on two masters as well. <laughs> Yeah. So the thing was, um, my brother, when he was murdered, I needed something to take my focus off of that. Um, so I started looking at certifications. I was working full time. And during this time, I didn't feel like that was enough to keep my mind from wondering about mm. the things that occurred. So I took the CEH um, exam and thought, wow, I really pulled this one off. <laughs> and so after I did this one, um, I decided to do CHI, the CHFI. And I passed that one within the second week. So the thing was, I locked myself away from everyone after I would get off of work, yeah. basically in what I call my dungeon. So yes. I locked myself away with my books and just sat back and studied and took practice exams. And then I would try to see what all I can find online that could better assist me as well, because mm-hmm. there's actually a lot of forms out there that can help you too if you don't understand things. Yeah. Um, after I passed that one, I decided to look at a Security Plus and I nailed it. So I started thinking, I'm really good at this. So I should continue, right? <laughs> Plus, I really yeah. love what I was doing. It was very exciting. So I oh, just yeah. continued on my career. I like that too. Um, you know, uh, we we talk a lot about uh, you know sort of self directed learning, and you know, and obviously, InfoSec offers you know sort of week long boot camps and things. But I like that you you had done that sort of yourself. You had you you built yourself this quote unquote dungeon where you could just just immerse yourself in this this one course of study for a whole week and then at the end of it you as you said you nailed it so can you talk about like the environment of your your quote-unquote dungeon like how did you build it specifically you know did you make it as comfortable as possible do you make it as uncomfortable as possible so you're not distracted um what were some of the factors that allowed you to sort of like really just like uh you know use the space to just get into the flow so first of all, I found a room that was separated from everybody else in the house. I needed yep. to be as far as away as possible because I had two kids. They were young at that time. Yeah. They were 23 and 29 now, but then they was very loud. <laughs> so mm-hmm. I had to block myself away. There was like one. So there was one room where you see one door and then there was a second door. And the third door is where you would actually find me locked away. OK. In a separate area. Yes. And you would find my books everywhere. And in order to keep my mind at bay sometime, I'll have like a few bears there so I can just mm-hmm. kind of sit down, and look at something that's happy. Because, as you know, when you're reading a lot of stuff in cyber, it can be a little dry. And sometimes yeah. you have to look at a little something kind of bounce you back up and make you go, OK, a- all right, back to yeah. work. And so yes. that's pretty much what I did. I, I didn't have a lot of technology around me. I would bring my phone with me only when I wanted to turn off when I turn off airplane mode in order to allow me to do some searching. Because mm-hmm. if you have your phone with you and you have it on, messages are going to go off, emails are going to come through, and people yep. are going to be constantly calling. Mm-hmm. That's a distraction. That's a distraction that I just did not need. So yeah. my phone was on airplane mode the whole time I was studying, unless I took a break and needed to do some searching. Did you did you have sort of like page goals for yourself each night, or I'm going to get to the end of this chapter, or did you just just kind of go and go and go until your like eyes were falling, you know, even until you're falling yeah. asleep. <laughs> I would go and go and go until my eyes started to fall asleep. And I used yeah. to buy like the Red Bull by the case. Yeah. Uh-huh. You can get like 32 of them. Yep. That was my thing. I get that my Red fuel. Bull. 
Yeah, yeah. I'm saying I'll just sit back and study. <laughs> yeah, I love it. Yeah, you, you know, one one week of exhaustion and then you emerge a champion. So it's a uh, well worth oh, it. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so, um, uh, you know, unfortunately, you told me that your your uh, abuse and harassment didn't go away in the workplace, but only continued. So what, what was the root of this abuse? And and what and, and speaking editorially, what should have been done by the company or the industry as a whole to prevent it? And, and what should be done to prevent similar tragedies in the future? So a lot of these issues begin early on, but I didn't really see a pattern until years later. Mm-hmm. And it was mainly because others was pointing out I was. I was into what I get, guess. Mm-hmm. So I started working in the cable industry. That's a good example. I had. Uh, um, so when I started a position, they knew I was in school. Mm-hmm. They agreed to excuse me for days when I had to take exams or taskings for classes. But as I continued my career, I had other managers that would continue with the same behavior. I actually had one manager at a Fortune 100 company that mm-hmm. told me I should drop out of the doctoral program and he would enroll. Um, I felt that wow. getting be, getting an education as an African American woman caused me to have so many issues with employers, mm-hmm. and I think my ambition made it a lot worse. And my ambition stemmed from doctors telling me that I would no longer be able to work or take care of myself, and mm-hmm. that's where I thrive from. Is looking at back at that and in my life and what they expected for me to be, and turning out to be someone totally different from what anyone ever expected as what makes me continue to push on. Yes, life was very difficult. Um, I never wanted to feel as though it was racial when I was working in these companies, but there was too many surrounding, too many scenarios that was surrounding me on a daily basis, which really yeah. showed it was actually true. I really did not want to believe it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, sure. Yeah, I, th- yeah. I think companies need to create diversity within leadership. Yeah. So there are a lot of companies that pretend that they are, but at the end of the day, it's a facade. So yeah. they create this press release like we were talking about before, and they give it to they create this press release to give people the illusion that they actually have um, they actually care about the diversity. And mm-hmm. when in actuality, they only doing it to help to improve their images. A lot of companies did that this year and last year. So yeah. I have looked at a lot of board of directors opportunities. I haven't had any success. Mm-hmm. I am on a few boards, but these are just regular boards that I actually contribute to. So when you actually look at the makeup of the companies where I actually apply, you know, I can actually look and see why these companies aren't having any diversity. They're trying to keep it the same way as it was back before. So I believe that there are still some good companies out there. However, I haven't come across them as of yet. And I won't give up because I feel like if I get a seat at the table, this will help me in order to create change, which is what I really want to do. Yeah, I think that's that, that's that's so important because uh, you know, I mean, we've been banging this drum for two years now about mm-hmm. getting uh, you know more diverse candidates into cybersecurity and how you know uh, you know diversity of backgrounds and stuff can uh, like help solve you know these problems that don't have that don't work as well in a monoculture. But at the same time, like I think a lot of even the best laid sort of diversity initiatives. Uh, end up that the, it's, it's it's a groundswell of diverse candidates in sort of entry level positions, but with not a lot of uh, sort of upward mobility, as you say, and especially not at the very upper echelons. Can you talk about uh, some sort of policy or structural changes that you would like to see that would uh, sort of facilitate uh, not just, uh, uh, you know, uh, diverse rank and file <laughs> employees, but, you know, it's people, you know, the, the sort of the generals and the sort of higher ups and the duchesses, as it were. <laughs> well, when it comes to looking at diversity, I think that companies need to be more open. You need to look at the actual resume and the past experiences of, of potential board members, but don't look at, for example, don't look at the name mm-hmm. because with me, I don't go by my first name. Yeah. I don't go by my first name because when I tried going by my first name before, when I first graduated with my bachelor's degree, no one would call and hire me. Mm-hmm. Now, when I started going by my middle name, everyone knows Chanel. Mm-hmm. Everyone is willing to talk to me. I got more job interviews and I landed multiple jobs. And yep. it was mainly because I stopped using my first name, which I don't think that life should be that way. So yeah. I think there needs to be policies in place where you have to really look at a candidate. You have to be open to diversity. You have to be open to not just men, but also women. You mm-hmm. have to, you have, you can't base people on their sexual orientation. It can be based on any disabilities. It's just based on the fact that they are the best candidate for the position. 
And if you feel like they're not, be willing to provide a reason why. Don't yeah. just reject somebody on the fly yes. because oh. you can provide feedback, which can actually help them later with another opportunity. Yeah. But these companies aren't doing that. They're just flat out rejecting people. Mm-hmm. And I know that it's not just for these type of positions, but for also for other types of positions where people are reaching out to me on social media. They want me to give them tips on how to look at jobs. Um, how can it get better with interviews? You know, mm-hmm. and some of them just say, why can't I get a job? And they're, they're applying for jobs in cybersecurity and IT, but it's really hard for them to land them. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, one of our past guests, uh, Jackie Ilshak, she she gets a ton of of LinkedIn messages from people saying she's in, in project management within cybersecurity, and and uh, people will say, uh, you know, I, I really want to I really want to get into that space, and you know, she'll give them like a five minute Zoom call to sort of like talk through things. But you know, I think there is that sort of lack of baseline understanding of like how to look for a job and how to present yourself and and so forth. But then at the same time, there's, like you said, there's also the sort of the the, the gatekeeping of, of sort of name bias, but also, uh, you know, if you don't put the right uh, listings in your, you know, electronic resume, then they get filtered out because, well, we, you know, we wanted this particular language, but you only had this other one, which also incorporates that one. But, you know, so many, so many little sort of, um, you know, unnecessary things that are keeping like really good candidates out of the out of the workforce exactly and a lot of these recruiters are actually just um searching for resumes based on keywords that eliminates people from the positions automatically Mm -hmm. yeah and then they and then of course the the you know the the paradox of that is they 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 say well we wanted to get someone you know diverse in here but we only got three you know we only got three candidates exactly <laughs> and, and it's like well a- yeah where did everyone where did everyone else go you know <laughs> it's almost <laughs> as if you uh you know set up a a system to uh to, to just put those three people there and don't don't forget about the other issue too a lot of people they are turned around and they are hire their friends so I've yeah. worked for plenty of companies where I've seen them interviewed they said we have to interview at least three people but one of the people are their friends. Mm-hmm. They already know they're going to hire their friend. So my thing is you have yeah. people coming in for interviews, getting all, they polishing themselves up, prepping yep. and all this other stuff. When you already know that you're not going to hire them. Yeah. I think that's messed up. Oh, I totally agree. Yeah. 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 I mean, that's, you know, interviews are hard enough as it is without, you know, not being told up front, like you're, there's no way you're getting this. Exactly. It's <laughs> or, 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 they, or they might say like, well, if you just happen to be a unicorn candidate where you're, you know, like 75 times better than, than my, my buddy over here, <laughs> then we'll give it <laughs> yeah. to you. But that, you shouldn't have to jump that high of a hurdle. That's, that's, that's ridiculous. Exactly. Yeah. So um, what was the path that brought you to founding Wyvern Security? I mean, I mentioned it a bit in the introduction, but can you tell our listeners more about the mission of Wyvern Security and the goals and purposes of the organization? Sure. So our mission is to provide public and private sectors with what we call first class cybersecurity services. My aim when I started was to help bridge the gap with cybersecurity professionals because no one helped me along the way and I had to figure out things on my own. So I'm trying to make things better for those that's actually trying to enter a field. So many people try to get into this field, but even after completing, for example, a certification or degree or both, it can be difficult to land an opportunity. A lot of the reasons is because they don't have experience is what they try to use as a reason not to bring someone in. Or it's like, they'll say, how are they supposed to get these? But my question is, how are they supposed to get the experience without someone giving them a chance? Yeah. If you don't give someone a chance, there's no way for them to get the experience. So this is where my other skills pop in as a professor, because I'm also a professor. Mm-hmm. I try to teach those skills, provide understanding, um, lay out certifications, discuss degrees and how they play in the cybersecurity arena mm-hmm. and be the person that they can vent to when it gets overwhelming, overwhelming and frustrating. So this is the reason my other company... <laughs> I have three. Okay. Um, this coders uh-huh. um, has created an application called Career on Demand Intelligence. It's hmm. called Cody for short. So we plan to release it within the next couple months. The application provides students with information for degrees of all levels, mm-hmm. um, certifications, career opportunities, financing, fellowships, grants, scholarships, webinars. And there's also an area specifically focused on um, Relax Zone. So the webinars actually look, yes, the webinars yeah. actually looks at um, your area of expertise or what you're trying to pursue. So yes. you can actually map the webinars to whatever you're trying to pursue so that you can actually attend those. Or yes. you can expand a little bit. But the relaxed zone, as we know as students, you can be quite stressed. 
Yeah. We all had a stressful days. So I put that in there to give students a way to uh, some time to play games for one. Mm -hmm. um, there's area for meditation and there's also an area for journal. So there's like three different sections in there for a relaxed zone. And each one of the sections has about three or four activities that you can do to help you relax. Cool. I love that. <laughs> Um, so, uh, what are some, some ways that you, you mentioned also in area I saw in the sort of company description, what are some ways that, that Wyvern works to bring diverse cybersecurity professionals, including gender, racial, and economically disadvantaged candidates to the cybersecurity industry? Are there certain strategies you've pursued that have been effective at helping diverse candidates enter the cybersecurity space, not just as workers, but as thought leaders? Yes. So we have connected with universities around the world. Mm -hmm. to help students to land their dream careers. And it's mm -hmm. actually a free service. Any company can actually sign up with them. So we believe that everyone should be treated equally, no matter their gender, race, or sexual orientation, or mm -hmm. any types of economic disadvantages. Because of my life struggles, I can relate and understand the challenges. So some of the challenges we use are, we try to look beyond the resume of a candidate. Because as we were talking before, you know, those resumes is one thing, but it really don't really tell you about that candidate. So majority of the cybersecurity opportunities list a, a dictionary of requirements, which mm -hmm. is overkill. I don't know if yeah. you, I know you've seen them. It's ridiculous. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, so yeah. Someone entry level position with CISSP record, you, you know, uh, experience or what have you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So someone may not have everything that's listed. And because yeah. of this, they get overlooked. But it does not mean that they're not open to learning. Yeah. A lot of people, especially a lot of people I've seen, they may not meet all the qualifications, but they're more than willing to learn in order to actually obtain that job. Yep. So allow these candidates opportunity to obtain those skill sets. Also, companies need to understand that cybersecurity is not a static field. It's dynamic. We're always changing. Mm -hmm. So it's constantly changing, which it enables the candidates to have the opportunity to be creative. So when I say creative, think outside of the box. It enables them to be more free and show their creativity, which also looks great with the company. Yeah. So yeah, I've yeah. seen where candidates are turning away because they feel that cybersecurity is too challenging to land a role. Companies have to change their way of thinking about cybersecurity candidates. At Wyvern, we believe in treating all employees as individuals, not an ID number, because that's what I felt like when I worked at so many companies. Mm -hmm. um, value their contributions and their ideas. Um, you want everyone to know that they matter. And still, these values must come from leadership, which increases morale, and it also ensures happiness when working inside of an environment. When someone's working at a company that they truly love, it shows in their work. It shows in the way that they work with other, um, in other employees. It mm -hmm. shows how they work with your customers. It actually shines through, and it just makes everything within the organization that much better. Yeah. Yeah. Can you talk about um, sort of from, you know, from the role of someone who obviously is, is you know, a manager or, you know, uh, has a bunch of people working for them? Like, what are some ways that you sort of change uh, a, a team culture where, you know, because I, th I think there is that that sort of that feeling of, of um, sort of fragility or whatever at the top where it's like, well, if someone, you know, has a better idea than me, then I either have to pretend like I thought of it or I have to dismiss it out of hand, even if it's a really good idea, because I can't, you know, stand that someone with, you know, one year of experience, you know, had a better idea than someone with 50 years, you know, or whatever. So like, do you, can you talk about the way that, that we can sort of like crack that ice? Because I think that that seems like that's a, that's a big part of if people don't feel like they can contribute meaningfully because they keep getting rebuffed or whatever, then they 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 just clam up in meetings or they stop suggesting things and then, you know, problem solving gets worse. I think a lot of that is, well, they fear that if they start speaking up or if they try to actually offer these types of ideas, someone else is going to get angry with them in, within a meeting. Yep. And what happens when it happens? They're worried about losing their jobs. I'm dealing with yeah. people like that every single day. Absolutely. So because of that, they try to they work a little differently. And so the way they actually way they are within meetings are going to be a different tone than it would be if they was actually being validated for what they're actually trying to contribute to the team. Mm -hmm. So I've seen that happen in a lot of cultures. And then you have the people that have more years of experience. They see someone that steps in as younger, might have a best idea, very creative, and it can save money, can save time, this, that, and the other. They're not going to like that because they're going to feel like that person, if it's something in their role, is overstepping. My thing is, don't think like that. You need to see that as a way for everyone to grow within the organization. It's not about you. It's everybody as a team. When mm -hmm. you work together as a team, it makes things run a lot smoother. Yes. And also, as I said before, things like this increases morale and mm -hmm. it makes everybody a lot happier. I don't know everything. 
So whenever someone gives me a bright idea, I'm all ears. I want to listen to it. And yes. I might even ask you, can you tell me a little bit more details? Because it's very interesting. And we, we are together are going to bring this up to the team. I'm going to let you go up there, give your demonstration and let everyone listen to your idea and figure out how we can actually incorporate this into the company. Mm -hmm. And don't be afraid because a lot of people have um, issues with public speaking. (laughs) So so that's another thing. That's another thing that stops people from speaking up because they're worried that, you know, they know that they have issues with public speaking. So they're afraid to actually talk. But if you get everyone to be more relaxed, more open and build that within the organization Mm -hmm. to help people to actually have more self-esteem about the way they're speaking or what they're talking about, have everyone to the point where they're willing to listen and be an actual team and not trying to be separated. This makes it so that everyone is actually contributing even more. Yeah. I think you, you get a sense of that. Sometimes you'll see a, you know, especially if there's like team building exercises with a company and then they, they ask a team like, you know, what's your opinion on this thing? And no one wants to talk because yeah. everyone, yeah, everyone's petrified. Like if I say the wrong thing, I'm going to get dinged or I'm going to get fired. Or I'm going to get demoted or whatever. And, you know, if you, if you, if people venture, you know, things and then no bad ramifications happen, like, then that next time you ask them their opinion, they're more free with it. And the next time even more so, and even more so, and it, I, you know, I think it, there's a, there's an element of repair to it. I think a lot of people are just so, uh, you know, um, just kind of frozen from either this job or even past jobs. I know it took me a long time in my own job to, you know, cause I, it was just so abusive in the previous job that, you know, when I just never volunteered anything. And I think, uh, you know, I think some of it is definitely change at the management level, but also, I mean, I think it's just time and repetition too. I agree. And you also got to think about COVID. COVID yeah. has made things a lot worse. Yes. So people are, a lot of people are agitated. Yeah. They don't, been, been, been that everybody's been working remote, some people don't know how to speak properly anymore, especially when it comes mm-hmm. to getting on calls. And whenever yep. they do, they kind of shy up and they don't want to say anything because they're worried if they say something, that's going to hurt somebody's feelings. Yeah. So they'll sit back and they'll be quiet. I've yeah. seen that too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And and there's no way to judge body language over Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. It's, it's, it's a whole different thing. Um, so as as we record this episode, it's it's the beginning of June. I think it's probably coming out about August or whatever, but it's it's uh, obviously Pride Month. So uh, we talk on the show a lot about how more device, diverse cybersecurity teams aren't just something to give the PR team warm fuzzies, but, you know, that bringing in people with different backgrounds, economic statuses, disabilities, neurodivergencies, et cetera, actively strengthen the team's ability to solve security problems, as well as um, you know, people who might not have otherwise been able to secure these sort of um, you know, high quality jobs, you know, and it helps them you know, provide a better life as well. But, um, but the problem, and I think it's one that would take a lot longer than an hour to even unpack, let alone solve, is, is that these types of diverse candidates and professionals with unconventional backgrounds or economic statuses or challenges in home life don't have the time or wherewithal to be actively knocking on our doors when the job listing goes up. So for organizations that really wanna find these types of diverse candidates, it seems like the time of waiting for talent to find us is over. Do you have any advice for taking the search for the new generation of cyber professionals to the people that might want or need the opportunity without knowing how much they could add to the industry? Yes, social media. Okay. So the reason why I say social media is because people are always posting on social media when they are seeking jobs. You'd yes. be amazed at how many shares they get when others are trying to help people to land the opportunities that they're mm. pursuing. So companies should follow a lot of organizations on social media that seek to help those that are trying to get into cyber. Why? Because typically people will often post their they are seeking jobs and they will tag those organizations. So there's one I think it's called um, Women in Cyber. Yes. Um, they're on um, they're actually on Instagram, not Instagram, but and they're on Twitter. Yeah. So following them on Twitter, yeah, they actually great. reshare information whenever somebody is trying to find a job. Mm-hmm. So also there are many organizations that offer free training, which I've seen this. There's uh, I think it's like 100 days of coding, which I found very interesting. Oh, cool. As yeah. someone actually, and it's free. It's on Twitter. Mm-hmm. Um, so Love follow it. these companies as well, because this can help you engage with those candidates for those opportunities, because these these people, well, these candidates are actually going out their way to take their time Mm -hmm. and actually do all this additional work for free just because they want to learn. So this is why I say you have to think out of the side of the box when it comes to the old way of recruiting and posting jobs. You have to be willing to be more creative in finding people. 
Uh, for example, there are over 330 million Twitter users right now in the world. Mm-hmm. LinkedIn is also a great resource. If you were to go on there and try to find candidates, I'm sure that anyone that is trying to find people for cybersecurity, IT, application development, anything, even looking at someone for finance work, you'll find them on these social media platforms. Absolutely. Yeah, no, I, I love that. And and especially the yeah, the Twitter angle, because I think a lot of people just think of it as something like something that I do when I'm when I'm not working, you know, like I'll, I'll yeah. take a Twitter break or whatever. But yeah, I think that's a, I think that's a really a uh, really great um, uh, piece of advice there that, uh, that that Twitter can actually be one of your search channels. Do you, I mean, do you have any advice? Do you have any, uh, Women in Cyber is a great example. We've, we've, we've totally worked with them in the past. Um, do you have any sort of um, Twitter follow suggestions of, of people or uh, organizations that you think would be especially useful for people trying to get in the industry? Uh, there's a few, but I would have to reach up to get it. <laughs> oh, it's okay. I'm just curious. Okay. Okay. Jump, jump to mind. Um, I would say I'm looking down for a second so I can pull them up. Sure. (laughs) There's a few few to actually look at. Um, so you could find, for example, um, cybersecurity SF, they post Mm -hmm. a lot of things. Okay. There's women of cyber jujitsu as well. Yeah. I, I, we work with them a lot. I, I, we have a partnership with them. They're awesome. Also, don't be afraid to follow the um, Asaka channels as well because they propose a lot of stuff yes. as well. Yes. Um, let's see. I'm trying to see if there's any more. Um, I also follow um, Emphasis Cure. They're okay. another good one. Um, Software Technologies. They're another good one. Mm-hmm. Of course, Women in Cybersecurity <laughs> um, Society. They're another good one. Yep. Um, those are the main ones I can think of right now. Oh, and Women in Tech Chat. Oh, um, okay. you post anything on there too, they will actually reshare to help you to get more views on your hits on your oh, own. I love it. Just to name a few, but there's, there's a lot of them out here. That's great. What is, what is the hundred days of coding? I'm very curious about that. So is it like every day they give you like a, a piece of coding advice or something? Yes. They actually oh. set up um, programs for you to actually code. Oh, wow. Yeah. So you can actually go in and try to learn coding beginning from the beginning steps like hello world. Wow. That yeah. sounds that sounds fun. And I got stuff with web development too. I'll see you link. <laughs> yeah. Okay, please do. Yeah, no. I I I think my afternoon's just been sorted here. Um, <laughs> uh, so um so moving on with this, uh, if we start hiring diverse candidates and I hope we do, one way to avoid leaving them high and dry is to make sure that the workplace uh can be fitting to their specific needs whether it's child care or parent caregiving or work adjustment for certain neurodivergent challenges or workplace accessibility, mentorship groups, social groups, et cetera. Uh, at the same time, large swaths of a cybersecurity issue has taken the stance of being, uh, you know, a work hard, play hard, burn the midnight oil type of industry, which I think often expects certain things from new hires that might discourage these new professionals and cause them to burn out or quit or not even Start. So my question is, is how do we start to turn the tide of the way cybersecurity as an industry is run in which sort of burnout is a given and, and some degree of do the work until the work gets done, even if it's night and weekends is expected of everyone? Unfortunately, I have seen this type of environment within so many companies. Mm-hmm. I have seen it in some of the contracts where Wyvern has teamed with other companies as well. So at Wyvern, we don't work that way. Um, that's not the life. That's not life. And it will burn out our employees. So I have seen people work on Saturdays without pay, Mm -hmm. fearing that they're going to lose their job. Someone said this to me actually yesterday. Um, Yeah. 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 Um, uh, This creates a very stressful environment. The way to turn the ties is for companies to learn that they should treat their employees the way they would be treated. That's something that I learned from my grandparents, and I still instill that today. I feel that the way companies are doing their employees is truly killing off some of the best talent because people are walking away. And mm-hmm. when I say best talent, people that's been here for years that are willing to teach and help to guide others because of the way the field is getting, they're like, I'm done. They, they yeah. just had enough. So yeah. they are leaving the workforce altogether or worse. I don't know. I know you've seen this on um, news channels. A lot of them are committing suicide. Yeah. It's yeah. been getting really bad. It's very so bad. Absolutely. I tell people when you get a job, that when you get a job that treats you this way, you need to walk away. Mm-hmm. You are more important than that job. Yeah. Um, I believe in work-life balance and not the facade of work-life balance like a lot of these other companies do. Right. I really feel like you should have a work-life balance. And if you can't get that at a current job that you have, then that job is not for you. Mm-hmm. Because it, it actually affects your mental health as well as your physical. So it's better to walk away from situations like that because no job is worth your life. 
No. Absolutely. Couldn't, couldn't agree more. Yeah. It's, it's uh, yeah. The only way you should be that invested in a company is if you own it <laughs> and even then <laughs> have a work-life well, balance. It's worth it. <laughs> yeah. You, you try to have work-life balance when you own companies, but at the end of the day, we try to do the best that we can. Yeah. I do work majority of time, seven days a week, but see, that's because I choose to. It's mm-hmm. not because I have to. Oh yeah. Because I want to make a difference so that I can actually help people to obtain the jobs that they're interested in. Mm-hmm. And the only way I can do that is continue to push forward with everything that I'm trying to do. Yeah. And I think, I think, uh, you know, I think that is also a misperception in a lot of heads of companies is that everyone else is as invested in their company as they are and has to be. And if you're not, you know, you're somehow like dragging things down, which is just such a, a horrible misperception. It is. Yeah. I agree. Uh, so what um, what advice do you have for young women seeking, as you did, to graduate from college or work in a field that requires uh, an advanced degree? Do you have um, any advice for that? Yes, I would advise them to not give up. So mm-hmm. earning degrees actually leads to experience in each area, which can provide you with the foundations of those areas that you didn't understand beforehand. It will help you to achieve new heights in your careers. Um, when applying for opportunities, if you don't get the job, it just means that job wasn't meant for you. Mm -hmm. A better job is waiting around the corner. A good example, I remember when I first graduated with my undergrad degree, I applied for a position where I needed to type 80 words per minute. Mm -hmm. I really, I fell short of that job and didn't get it because I fell short of typing 80 words per minute. I was devastated because I really needed that job. I needed the income. We were a family of four. So of course I needed more income. A week later, after applying for a lot of companies, I landed a role with a large data center where I handled configurations all day for failures for, drop, for um, hard drops. The job paid double what the other job did. Hmm. So I say that to say you should never give up. Another example, while I was working at this company, a Fortune 100 company, um, actually reached out to me through a recruiter. I was working third shift at this data center. So I would get off from work. I would meet recruiters at coffee shops. <laughs> in the morning after leaving that job to do wow. interviews with them. And then I would go home and get my kids dressed to go to school. Mm-hmm. I say that to say that you have to do what's necessary in order to land the opportunities that you want, because that job, I actually love that job as a contractor. I love that job. And I was working as a contractor, becoming an employee actually changed the whole morale of everything. Mm. It was a lot different. The yeah. structure was not good, but at the end of the day, for four years, I was extremely happy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. During the, yeah. contra- the the four contractor years. So it, yeah. was, was it that once you, you became a full-time employee, like you got to see how the sausage got made or you, you got to see too much of like what the inside machinery was? I got, yes, I did. And see, as a contractor, I was working mm-hmm. overtime, but I was doing it because I wanted to. I had with data center moves and stuff like that. And mm-hmm. that was me working for free because yeah. I was wanting to learn the skills. They did it on the weekends. Mm-hmm. So I would do stuff like that. My clients, I used to audit DOD and Intel, even the ones that people don't know exist. Uh-huh. <laughs> and I would not reveal any locations. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I um, actually did, a, I audited them for years while I was working at this particular company. Uh-huh. But at the end of the day, I would actually be the type of person where I could be cooking dinner and I could be on a classified call at the same time. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. They would hear me like literally cooking. It's um, Sarah, they can hear stuff right in the background. I'm like, yeah, you need to enter this code. You need to do this. You need to do that. And just uh-huh. kind of keep it moving. Please because hold the water the boiling. Day, yeah. <laughs> at the end of the day, I wanted to keep the client happy. Yes. And I really love what I do. Got it. The only Got thing it. that changes the way someone loves what they do is when they have bad management. Mm-hmm. Bad management will decrease morale of any company. Yes. I'm and saying that now on a few contracts. <laughs> absolutely. And and conversely, like if you suddenly have a good manager after years of not having a good manager, like it just changes your complete relationship. Even if you're working harder, it just changes your complete relationship to your 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 sort of pride in your job, I think. Yes, it does. It yeah. changes everything. It really does. Uh, so um, what advice do you have for people who might be listening to this episode and that find themselves in a fraught situation. Maybe they have a lack of support from their family or precarious economic status or housing instability or lack of access to health care, but who have heard the story of Dr. Schnell Suggs and feel that their talents and experiences would help them do well in an industry that can help them start a new life. Can you suggest resources or starting places where listeners can go to sort of extricate themselves from life situations that would prevent them from even taking the first step on a journey like yours? Sure. I would say if you have close friends that can relate, reach out to them. Mm -hmm. Um, If you're in the church, reach out to your pastor. 
Yes. Um, other areas you can reach out to is going to be counselors. If you're in a university, you can reach out to your guidance counselors and they can provide you with assistance. Also, if you're not into any of those since COVID, I don't think a lot of people will realize this. There's a lot of free resources out there for mm. counseling to people to help you to grasp the things that are going on in the world, as well as to help you to lay out what you're trying to achieve in your life. And this is free services. They even offer it for mm-hmm. companies. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. There's I, lots I, of things out there. A lot of them are, are waiting for someone to uh, to call in and, and don't know why <laughs> no one is because they don't know about it. Exactly. Um, so uh, as, as we wrap up today, uh, we talked about a bit at the top, but can you tell us a bit more about your, your book, Against All Odds, Overcoming Racial, Sexual, and Gender Harassment in the Digital Battlefield? Sure. Mm-hmm. I will say it is a story about overcoming racism, sexual mm-hmm. assault, physical abuse, kidnapping, and years of daily harassment. Mm-hmm. It's about surviving domestic violence. It's about a woman that came up in the world of cybersecurity against all odds. It's about finding ways to find positive energy to improve a person's situation, regardless of what's going on. I grew up in a rural area where dreams do not come true. Absolutely do not. Mm-hmm. I mean, I've lost so many people that I grew up with when I was in school that are now gone. A lot of it was a tribute to violence. So where everyone's ambition is just to survive is what that area was mainly about. So I went through harassment, both verbal, physical and sexual in many industries. But I did not let that stop me. To me, it was no different than the battles I fought growing up as a child. So you have to find a way to cope with the environments of your life and figure out the best route for you. No situation is permanent. It's only permanent if you allow it to be. I truly believe that life is what you make it and not what is given. So the book is not just about, for example, how a woman has cut her own path in a male dominated field um, of technology or cybersecurity, nor is it just about someone who overcame physical and sexual abuse to prosper as an adult. It's about the determination, inspiration, and perseverance, I can't get it out, needed to work hard at overcoming the worst the world can throw at you and still help lead an industry that has top priority in today's geopolitics and globalized marketplace. Yeah, well, that, that's what I was trying to say. What? Oh, perseverance. perseverance. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, yep. Um, uh, so where can people find this book? And if they want to talk to you, where can they find you online? Okay, so they can get the book on Amazon. If they okay. want an autograph copy, they can reach out to me on the Duchess of Cybersecurity website. Okay. They can also reach out to me directly on um, Instagram, Twitter, as well as LinkedIn. Great. I did have a Facebook account, but I closed it because when a book came out, we had I had some um, things I had to deal with with family. A sure. lot of family members did not know a lot of things that I endured as a child or mm-hmm. as an adult. Mm-hmm. So I closed my Facebook account because of that, because it just wasn't the energy was too negative. And I'm one of those people where I feel that you have to remove negative energy. Yeah, no, I, I say I, that I, completely. <laughs> So I say that to say that you can find me on a Duchess of Cybersecurity site. And if yeah. you just want to have a general conversation, please reach out to me on LinkedIn. So is the, the website is duchessofcybersecurity.com. Is that right? Yes, it is. Okay, perfect. Dr. Suggs, thank you so much for your time and insight today. I really enjoyed talking to you. I did too. This was a lot of fun. <laughs> thank you. I'm so glad to hear that. Uh, and as always, I like to thank everyone who is listening to and supporting the show. New episodes of the Cyberwork Podcast are available every Monday at 1 p.m. Central, both on video at our YouTube page and on audio, wherever you get your podcasts. We're everywhere. I just wanted to make sure that you all know that we have a lot more than weekly interviews about cybersecurity careers to offer you. Uh, you can actually learn cybersecurity for free on our InfoSec skills platform. Just go to infosecinstitute.com slash free, create an account, and you can start learning right now. We have 10 free cybersecurity foundation courses from podcast guest Keytron Evans, six cybersecurity leadership courses from Cicero Chimbanda, 11 courses on digital forensics, 11 courses on incident response, seven courses on security architecture, plus courses on DevSecOps, Python, JavaScript, ICS, and SCADA security fundamentals, and more. Just go to infosecinstitute.com slash free and and start learning today. Thanks very much once again to Dr. Chanel Suggs, the Duchess of Cybersecurity, and thank you all so much for watching and listening. We'll speak to you next week. Mm-hmm.